Chapter 1-2 Darwin's Posers What is the biological evolution? The definition given by Merriam-Webster Dictionary states, descent with modification from pre-existing species. That definition immediately brushes out any hint of creativity or intelligence involved in the process. New species were not created, they descended naturally from a common ancestor. Given the complexity of the living matter, many researchers and thinkers came to conclude that something supernatural should be involved here. The Oxford Dictionary gives a more cautious definition. The process by which different kinds of living organism are believed to have developed from earlier forms during the history of the Earth. Indeed, all scientific discoveries made to date do confirm that life on the Earth is changing. New biological forms appear in certain sequence, and later forms resemble previous ones. More than that, they all share the same biological bricks. Amino acids, DNA structure, etc. Paleontological discoveries, geological data, and the work of breeders all tell us unequivocally that life forms are changing, developing slowly but steadily. Note that over the history, the transformation of biological organisms goes in the direction with obvious vector from simple to complex. And what is the theory of evolution? This question is harder to answer because the single theory at the moment does not exist. According to authoritative evidence, Dr. Alexander Markov, there is no generally satisfactory theory. Here is a quote from his book. Although every new step brings us new knowledge, there is no sign of life comprehension. The flow of new discoveries is constant. Our ideas about the structure and development of living matter are still imperfect and incomplete. Theorists do not have time to grasp new facts simply because they accumulate too quickly. Many discoveries, despite the extraordinary speed of mastering information in the modern world, caught scientists unsuspected. We seldom succeed in predicting, based on the already available data, what awaits for us the next turn. And this means that we do not yet have a holistic understanding of life. There is no unified theory. But if there is no unified theory, then what are the separate ones? What theory are young students taught by the academic professors? According to the famous British biologist Dennis Noble, which he described in the fundamental study Music of Life, in the Anglo-Saxon world, evolutionary debates are mainly conducted between Stephen Gould and Richard Dawkins and their supporters. What are the differences between those two irreconcilable evolutionary concepts for which scientists of the Anglo-Saxons are fighting? At first glance, it is a trifle. Richard Dawkins, in his many books and lengthy lectures, denies a big difference between these two points of view. Evolution by Dawkins occurs by small, gradual changes and is to a certain degree synonymous with the evolution as such. To understand better the mind of a great philosopher, let us get a quote from his most popular book, The Blind Watchmaker. Do you remember William Paley with his watch found on the wasteland? In his book, the atheist Richard Dawkins bravely challenges the priest's conjecture and explains scientifically how the squirrel gradually turns into a bird. Read carefully and watch his hands closely. To begin with, an ancestor like an ordinary squirrel, living up trees without any special gliding membrane, leaps across short gaps. It could leap further if it had something to slow a fall. So natural selection favors individuals with slightly pouched skin around the arm or leg joints, and this becomes the norm. Now, any individuals with an even larger skin web can leap a few inches further. So in later generations, this extension of skin becomes the norm, and so on. It is easy to imagine true flapping flight evolving from repetition of the muscular movements used to control glide direction. So average time to landing is gradually postponed over evolutionary time. Some biologists, however, prefer to see long-distance downhill gliding as the dead end of the tree-jumping line of evolution. Perhaps birds began flying by leaping off the ground, while bats began by gliding out of trees. Or perhaps birds, too, began by gliding out of trees. The debate continues. Is that a science? Many call this kind of explanation as just-so stories, which are suitable for the fair tales and not for solid scientific theories. The microbiologists have learned that there is more than one random mutation separating two different species. A lot of coordinated changes in the genetic code are needed to happen in a group of animals. All these changes must occur together, harmoniously. That is, biology tends to favor saltationism and does not support gradual, mini-tiny transitions. 
Let us draw an analogy looking at much less sophisticated example than a living organism. We will compare the two devices. One is a radio receiver and another is a tape recorder. If we look inside any of these devices, we find that they are built with similar parts. They have the same transistors, printed circuit boards, resistors, capacitors, and transformers. There are differences, however. In the tape recorder, we find rotating bobbins. In the receiver can, only one rotating part, the tuning knobs. A competent electronics engineer can design and build both a receiver and a tape recorder. But let us ask him to build a tape recorder by small gradual changes in the design of the receiver. Give him the following gradualist instructions. First, remove the resistor R12 from the receiver circuit. Then reduce the capacitance of the filter capacitor C14 and a half. And then, at this point, an angry engineer would interrupt you. He may even use offensive language by doing that. For after the first minuscule interference in the circuitry, it will cease to function. Everyone understands that the tape recorder needs to be designed from scratch. Only saltationism works here. Gradualism can change the receiver's operation by tuning it to a different frequency range, increasing the volume, and improving the sound quality. A new kind of electronic device can be obtained by leaping step, by removing the previous device many parts and nodes and replacing them with new ones. You need to do this at the same time, and not with many consecutive small steps. The principles of electricity remain the same for both devices. Most of the details are used, but devices are different and perform different functions. This is a saltationism. But enough with the radio or recorder. Now the programmers rule the world. Running on modern operating systems, computing machines surround us at every step. We buy goods in the store or via the internet using computer programs. The cashier does not calculate how much you pay. He simply scans the goods over the barcode reader and the screen shows the name, cost, and percentage of the discount, if it is a sale today. We book a plane ticket to New Orleans, find out the weather in Shanghai, and the availability of hotel rooms in Santiago de Chile with the help of invisible but powerful and friendly software. Any of us has one, two, or even more programmers among our friends and associates. Let us find the friendliest of them and ask him to show the new computer code. For instance, the operating system Windows 7. Send him for coffee, and while he is out, take the keyboard and try to make a new operating system, Windows 10, by changing the code gradually, one symbol at a time. Do not forget that the genetic mutations in living nature, according to the Darwin-Dawkins teaching, are random. Then boldly change any character in the programming code. Do not forget to save the change as the nature saves new genetic information. So far, you are doing everything according to the canons prescribed by the theory of evolution. In biology, such random modification is called a mutation. Well, your friend will not necessarily still be that friendly upon return, because the operating system does not work as before. One symbol, one accidentally changed sign, makes it most likely inoperative. In this imaginary case, your access to the computer will be denied for a long time. Poor programmer will spend many hours searching for and correcting your intervention. He must explain to you that one mutation is not enough to make Windows 10 from the Windows 7 operating system. An accumulated, synchronous change in the program is necessary. It is customary, as any employee of Microsoft or Yandex knows, to produce many mutually agreeable mutations of the program code, and they are checking and testing the whole program until Windows 10 works to the expectations. What are you doing wrong here? A skilled evolutionist would explain that your mutation is a bad one. It caused irreparable harm. In the case of a living being, a wrong mutation would lead to a sick or incapacitated newborn. Genetic experts know. More than 90% of all mutations are harmful. Some believe even in higher numbers, up to 99%. There are also neutral mutations. If in the radio receiver, you replace a 2SK34 transistor with RFMO1 or a 1-watt resistor with a 2-watt one, the circuit will still continue to work. In computer code, you can also randomly replace a character that does not damage the workability of the program. And only in rare, quite improbable case, the replacement of a component or a character can accidentally lead to an improvement in functioning. But for success, one needs to make thousands of changes. You need to coordinate them among themselves, and this is a very complex and skillful work. It is performed by people with a special education who know what changes to make and where, 
and most importantly, they foresee the ultimate goal. The purpose is to create a new device or operating system. A working tape recorder or its concept is already in the head of the designer. How can uneducated nature cope with this task? It does not know where to go, and there is no pre-planned set of actions for it. Nothing is easier, evolutionist scientists explain. Nature has a mighty instrument called natural selection. According to the Darwinists, any changes leading to the improvement of the breed are inherited, and those that worsen it are dying off. Nature enjoys such an unlimited resource as time. Nature is patient. The programmers or developers of new gadgets do not have such a privilege. They must get ahead of competitors and launch their products on the market earlier than other engineers or programmers. But Mother Nature has millions, hundreds of millions, billions of years at her disposal. However, as was shown in the earlier section, sometimes even an infinity may not be enough if you are going to assemble a simple protein. It does not work for a blind, natural watchmaker. The famous American biochemist, Michael Behe, after many years of contemplating, concluded that gradual changes at the cellular and subcellular level cannot achieve the construction of any complex protein structure. He wrote the book Darwin's Black Box, where he introduced the concept of irreducible complexity. By irreducibly complex, he means a single system composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function, wherein the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. An irreducibly complex system cannot be produced directly, that is, by continuously improving the initial function, which continues to work by the same mechanism, by slight successive modifications of a precursor system, because any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is non-functional. A famous example is the flagellum. This organ is found in many bacteria and looks like a tail, far exceeding the bacterium in length. If humans would have a flagellum, it would stretch for about 50 meters. The flagellum rotates at a rather high speed and thus the bacterium can move in a liquid medium. At first glance, it does not look like something special. Big deal, a flagellum. But when the microbiologist explored it along and across, literally, the complexity and grace of the miniature machine shocked them. What do we see in the following picture? Nothing less than the most perfect electric motor. This motor is incredibly tiny and very efficient. It can rotate at a speed of 20,000 revolutions per minute and sometimes accelerates to 100,000 revolutions per minute. At this speed, it can reverse the direction of rotation at a quarter of the turn. This engine has everything, like its man-made counterpart created by skilled engineers that is built of a set of magnetic plates and copper wires. It has a stator and a rotor. It firmly holds onto the membrane. The propeller analog, a filament, is attached to the rotor through a hook, which acts as a propeller shaft. It was recently discovered that in this structure there is even a clutch. The efficiency of this motor is about 95%. Is this number small or big? I looked to the modern standards that large electric motors should satisfy and discovered an interesting trend. Indeed, the efficiency of really powerful engines can reach 95% or even 97%. Such numbers are achieved for engines in excess of 200 to 300 horsepower. The smaller the motor, the efficiency it's lower. The flagellum electromotor is not just small, it is super miniature, and it works better than the big one. The diameter of the flagellum is about 2 nanometers. I doubt that the state-of-the-art, inertia-free motors can change the direction of rotation by one quarter of a revolution. The flagellum motor is a very complex object. It is controlled by ions, which at the right time appear in the right place and give the rotor a spin. Do not ask how they do this. The details of the functioning at the time of this book writing are unknown even to the most meticulous experts. Let us look at the simplest part of the motor device, which is a filament. Again, it does not seem complicated, just like a whip. But if you look at it through an electron microscope and even cut it in several places, you will be surprised. This whip consists of 11 sets of microtubules. Two are located in the middle and nine at the periphery. Each of the nine tubes is double. Their halves are called nexins. Nexin is made up of proteins, as the factory pipe consists of bricks. Nexins are fastened together along the entire length, like two hoops with overlap, and a smaller hoop is attached to a pair of handles. Nexins are connected by non-axial bridges between each other. From each pair, 
A spoke is directed toward the inner pair of microtubules. In the process of filament building, new bricks are added to the end until the flagellum of the desired length is built up. Bricks are held tightly to each other by electrostatic force. One part of them is positively charged and the other is negative, and all this is kept on the cell membrane. With the help of such a motor, bacteria develop a speed of up to 60 times the length of their body per second. For comparison, the maximum and very short length speed of a cheetah does not exceed 25 lengths of its body, and the cheetah is considered to be the fastest animal on earth. The flagellum mechanism consists of approximately 50 parts represented by a set of 30 different proteins. It contains about 10,000 amino acids with a clear sequence encoded by 50 genes. Imagine that out of all the components of the flagellum protein structure, one, only one, was out of place. Or there is a wrong protein somewhere. Well, the entire motor would stop working, or even worse, fall apart. To imagine a similar mechanism without just one component is simply impossible. This is called the irreducible complexity. To build such a simple machine by minuscule improvements cannot be imagined. At least, I would not endeavor to do that. But the representatives of the most powerful scientific discipline, the theory of evolution, they can. The challenge was taken by the brave American professor, evolutionist, Kenneth Miller. Here is what he writes and says in his lectures. Do not forget to watch his hands as well. Professor Behe asked to show him how to remove one part of the flagellum without disturbing its functioning. We will not waste time trifling. We will remove 20 pieces at once. And what do we get? well-known in biology system of secretion type 3. In it, you can find half of those parts that are used in the flagellum. Well, the secretion system type 3 does exist. It does not rotate a filament and serves not for the movement of the bacteria, but for injecting poisons into the victim's body. It is not entirely clear how from initial 20 proteins you can smoothly switch to twice as many, but who cares? Professor Miller genuinely thinks he resolves Behe's conundrum. K. Miller, as a true miracle maker, just turned deaf ear to the M. Behe request to remove one part. He removed 20. Isn't that nice? I cannot restrain myself and must add one more example of the iron logic of the Darwinists. It is taken from the lecture of one of the four horsemen of atheism named Dan Bennett. Here is what he reported to the enthusiastic audience. About one billion years, there were unicellular, so-called prokaryotes. One fine day, after a billion years of existence, two prokaryotes floated to themselves, and then bang! Instead of one eating up another, as was customary, they boom! And emerged into one organism. So there were eukaryotes. Boom kaboom! The theory of evolution triumphs. The audience gives a standing ovation. The young ladies weep with delight. The scientific method nervously smokes in the corner. If you think that the unique, most ridiculous arguments of the defenders of the Darwinian concept of evolution are gathered here, I can assure you that this is not so. I will not consider in detail the arguments and evidences of well-known evolutionary biologists. Near all of them are built on arbitrary presumptions and far-fetched conclusions. Let us briefly discuss the most interesting part, paleontological evidence, which is the fossils. Indeed, the findings in ancient sedimentary rocks clearly show that at first there were simple organisms. Then a little more complicated appeared. Many of phyla emerged during the Cambrian explosion. Then began the era of dinosaurs. Mammals began to be born. From somewhere, primates came. Then, higher primates. And finally, a modern man. We do not challenge this historical trait but it is difficult to reconcile with elementary twisting of logic. If one species appeared later than the other and has a certain similarity with it, that does not mean that the first was the direct ancestor of the second. Each subsequent one could arise by itself, independently. The modern car resembles the models of the 1900s. It uses some of the familiar parts and technical solutions, but it was designed and built from scratch. There was no smooth creeping of one into the other. How do we know this? Yes, it was happening before our eyes. All moves are recorded in this game. Imagine now that a group of astronauts from Mars arrived on Earth and happened to land on a giant car junkyard. Possessing the scientific apparatus created by most famous scientist Marles Marwin, astronauts will inevitably conclude that they have discovered the remains of a complex life, and its evolution took place during a relatively short period of time and preceded by gradual evolvement. The Latin phrase, post hoc ergo propter hoc, 
after this, because of this, refers to elementary logical errors, in which the cause-effect relationship is identified with a chronological temporary. Professor Stephen Gould also recognized that the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. We fancy ourselves as the only true students of life's history, yet to preserve our favored account of evolution by natural selection, we view our data as so bad that we never see the very process we profess to study. The irony is that the evolutionists, starting with the founder of the theory, always hoped that the obvious difficulties that arise at a certain historical stage of the theory development will be overcome by subsequent scientific discoveries and achievements. Unfortunately to them, quite opposite happens. The more discoveries were made by researchers, the more contradictions and direct refutations the great theory were received. Mathematics, paleontology, microbiology, genetics... All these fields of human research brought very unpleasant surprises to evolutionists. Criticism of the theory of evolution is widespread. I will bring your attention now to just one argument which is very rarely mentioned in the literature. Darwinism is completely unable to explain why evolution is constantly and stubbornly moving towards more sophisticated living organisms. It is not difficult to see that complex organisms are less adapted. The simplest organisms are better built to win the competition for survival. If the main message of Darwinism about natural selection is taken at face value, then the evolution should move in the opposite direction, from a complex being, such as a human who cannot survive without clothes and dwellings, to primitive bacteria. The latter feel great in a wide temperature range and in any, even oxygen-free atmosphere. But something is pushing the evolutionary transformations upwards, from primitive and incredibly tenacious to complex and fragile beings, capable of survival only under favorable conditions. What is this power? God? Supernatural being? Aliens? Do not rush with conclusion. The most interesting part is ahead. 